Hello and welcome to another episode of Deep Town Divers VR show. This is the show where we talk about tech, blockchain, VR, XR, AR, and many more interesting things. And today I'm very excited to have Ken by with us. So hello, Ken. Thanks for uh, accepting our invitation. Glad to have you with us. Yeah, for sure. And uh, we'll be discussing many things, including what Kent is doing in VR industry and how the VR industry and AR industry is evolving. So stay tuned for that. So Kent, thanks for being with us today. Thanks for accepting the invitation. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to, to have you here and to, to discuss uh, all stuff VR. Yeah, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. So um, you are, for those who don't know Kent, even though I cannot imagine you don't, but let's, let's assume that, um, you are a host of Voices of VR podcast, you are a philosopher, you are a journalist, um, you, you do a lot of different takes on different topics, uh, whether it's history or, or VR, AR, XR. Um, and as we remember, uh, we did a, an UFO, uh, UFO talk um, uh, recently and, uh, you know, uh, not recently, but some times ago, but you kind of, you, you do dive the uh, deep dives into different topics. Um, and um, yeah, what, what, is, what is the latest and greatest from your work? Um, maybe some other podcasts you are, you, are, you are trying to start or you are having and, and, and our audience uh, don't know about yet. Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, just to take a, a bit of a step back in 2014, I started the Voices of VR podcast at the Silicon Valley Virtual Reality Conference. Um, and since then, I've recorded probably around 1,500 different interviews uh, and wow. published a, uh, over 900 of them so far. So about two thirds of the different pieces that I've published. Um, and, you know, for me, I'm just fascinated with VR as a medium and, and really curious to see how it's going to continue to evolve and grow. Um, and some of the other podcasts that I've started to record but haven't fully launched or released yet is, you know, uh, ones on artificial intelligence, uh, philosophy, mathematics, uh, the decentralized web. Um, and, yeah, just generally looking at all these uh, different uh, podcasts or di different topics, they're all kind of coming together. So I feel like virtual reality, to me, is the thing that I keep coming back to because it it's a new medium that I think is going to open up all sorts of new possibilities for communication and for, uh, you know, just how we are able to tell stories. And basically that's by what I've been tracking over the last six years is all the different domains of human experience where VR is going to be impacting us. Right. Amazing. And I've listened to many episodes, maybe not all the 900, but uh, a lot. Uh, so, uh, and they're really great. Uh, what is, how, how do you see, because you've been in this industry so long and you've talked to many people, founders and creators and, you know, developers, how do you see industry changing the VR industry from 2014 uh, to 2020? What do you see, you know, people maybe had some assumptions in 2014, 15 and uh, what has happened or not happened and materialized, uh, until today? Yeah. Yeah. I think the, um, it's a uh, for me when I get talk about this issue, I, I think about VR as a medium, to all the affordances and what's new about it, and if you take a step back and look at it as the evolution of communications mediums, then I'm personally convinced that it's a matter of of when, not if, that this medium is going to propagate um, out into all of the different uh, domains of human experience. The question is when and what that actually looks like. Uh, we can look at some analogs like maybe the personal computer or cell phones, uh, TV, radio, film, you know, all these are previous mediums and they all have a way that they disperse out into the world. Um, the difference with VR is that it is, it feels like it's a new paradigm shift where it's not like the cell phone was something that, you know, you already had a phone in your house potentially and to be able right. to have your phone as you're traveling around was great and and be able to basically take what everything you used to do on a laptop within the phone so it feels like that is uh, a much clearer path in retrospect for how something like the cell phone would take off but vr as an ar is a little bit different just because it's it feels like it could supplement or change all of those existing things but there's already existing ways to do a lot of those things right and it's pretty mature and so it's not like 
uh, so it, it's a little confusing as to, you know, what is the catalyst going to be for something like this to really take off? It seems like the COVID-19 and the global pandemic with everybody locked down, that could be one catalyst. But um, what I see, what's happening is that you have all these different disciplines, whether it's, you know, architecture, or industrial design, game design, web design, uh, storytelling, uh, film, uh, like lighting and sound design, uh, everything from like theater and um, other aspects of like uh, integrating all these different aspects of your sensory experience. So biometric data and health. So it's like all these fusions of all these things coming together. And it's a bit of like everybody from each of those disciplines has some insight to provide. And it's going to take people over time to figure out like what the the unique affordances of the medium are. So that's one aspect of just what the medium is and what it can do. And then the other aspect is the uh, distribution platforms. And mm -hmm. so we've had continued iterations from like Oculus Rift DK1 to CV1 to, you know, the, the, the Rift and the Rift S and then Oculus Quest and the Gear VR is in there. And then, you know, uh, the Val Valve's Vive with HTC and then the Valve Index. And so yep. you have these continued iterations of the technology platform and they'll go out and they'll sort of re reach a certain um, penetration of market. And then the next version will come out and it'll continue to sort of go out there. So I see this as a long process of technology uh, diffusion and technology like uh, innovation, like the, the platform itself, and then in, it getting out to the people. Those are two different things where the technology is continuing to evolve, but it's also continuing to get out to people. So, I mean, the big question is, okay, when when is it going to become like mass ubiquitous? I mean, I, I don't know if anybody can answer that exactly because, you know, who would have yeah. known this is how 2020 was going to be unfolding. But what we can see is that, uh, well, what I can see at least is that there's enough compelling aspects about the medium that it's going to continue to take its time and get out there and people will discover it when they're ready and it'll continue to solve new problems uh, as people um, get to use it and then kind of <laughs> reinvent the wheel and see what's been done before. And so it's this this long process of uh, what I say is like this the spatial computing paradigm shift yep. is, is not going to happen overnight. But yeah. for anybody who's been an early adopter, you can start to see some of the writing on that wall. Uh, I totally agree with you, and um, uh, it's definitely you know it's 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 a marathon, not a not a sprint. And um, I think another big aspect of of VR becoming something uh, bigger than what it is now, for example, is software, right? Like what people hardware is important, and it will you know it evolves, and it, it it becomes better and cheaper, but um, also software how how exactly we'll use those headsets and what we'll be doing while we're using those headsets. That's one of the you know big questions, um, and I think there is a lot of there is a lot of things right now available in terms of what people can do and maybe some games, but um, I think there is a lot of things beyond that, right? Uh, productivity or or even beyond the productivity, like what you can do inside VR, how can you push the boundaries? Why would people want to come back every day and spend hours in VR if they have the, you know, a perfectly fine headset and, and they have everything uh, they need on the hardware side? What would be that VR uh, software experience which will drive people back? Um, I think that's that's another question which is uh, important uh, to to answer. What, what do you think about that? Um, yeah, so I've been asking people what they think the ultimate potential of VR is for the last uh, six years, and so um, you know it's interesting to take take a look at those answers and to try to you know make some sense of what some patterns are. For me, I feel like comfortable in saying that VR is going to be impacting us for every domain of, of our human experience. And the way I kind of break that down is like entertainment and uh, medicine and uh, hanging out, going on dates with our partners. So, uh, but also dealing with death and grieving and loss, uh, but also um, higher education, travel, spirituality, aspects of, uh, you know, training uh, but as enterprise applications, so, you know, architecture and other ways that any type of spatial design that you're using, so, you know, or work from home uh, to be able to actually sort of switch your context. Um, you have c hanging out with uh, friends and uh, going on, uh, you know, different adventures with them. Uh, people who are isolated in some ways so that you're able to give them access to uh, connecting to other people. Uh, expressions of your own identity and your avatar representation. And it's like, you know, a new form of clothes that you're able to actually embody these different avatars. Um, 
so your your body, yourself, your av avatar identity expression, new economic models, which I think you know you're exploring a lot of things here with yep. Somnian Space, with you know just the blockchain and uh, exchanging of virtual goods, and what's it mean to have an experience based economy rather than stuff that's uh, consumable goods, uh, and then you know uh, telepresence, uh, communication, other ways of early education, uh, and then connecting to your your home and family, so building your virtual home. Uh, but also connecting to your family and potentially being able to record your yourself and be able to um, be able to speak to uh, many different generations of, of volumetric capture. So imagine being able to potentially interact with your uh, a volumetric capture of your ancestors. Um, yeah. So generally, that's sort of like a high level overview of all the different contexts that I see. Uh, and there's many sort of nuances and other specific applications within there, but um, it depends like people often talk about the killer app. And I think for some people, it's like, well, depending on what your context is and what you're using it, there's going to be a killer app for each of those different contexts. Um, and where your center of gravity is or what you're drawn to, or, you know, for me, the, the definition of a killer app is what is the thing that you want to do that you can't do with VR that causes you to go out and buy it. And then you end up using it to the point where you feel like uh, your purchase was justified because you're able to get yep. so much value out of that. Uh, and whether or not you come in every day or whether or not you use it once and it you know, it serves its purpose, uh, like you get trained in doing something. Um, yeah, I think there's going to be a range of, of things that people either come in and do it uh, every day or they're doing it, um, you know, like once, uh, yeah, one, once a one, month or once one, a year exactly. or once ever. Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. And, and I think, um, you know, coming back to... to um, the being able to interact with with your ancestors or with yourself or you know your kids with you later that's something we have already um planning and trying to do uh we planned that since 2017 like we call it live forever mode basically we'll capture everything you do on your parcel uh if you wish so of course and then uh we'll try to recreate you as your avatar um you know as an ai using some kind of ai that interactable avatars basically whenever you are not here you'd be able to place it uh, or if something happens to to the person then others can come in and interact so that's something we're exploring and we want to launch uh one you know first version of that this year uh in terms of recording uh, the data and then uh and then later on to try to recreate something so that's that was a personal kind of wish of mine to be able to kind of make that happen because vr is a perfect uh, thing for that you feel like you are there you feel the presence you feel the person's presence and uh, that's that's pretty pretty amazing um w which headset do you use right now well you you are in valve index right yeah, I'm in Valve Index. Yeah, with the Index controllers. Yeah. How do, how do you? What I and I end up using the Quest um, a lot. I've been playing a lot of Tetris Effect lately, <laughs> uh, but uh, and sort of hopping in. Um, but I'm in my VR room, and so when I come up and do PC VR, then I usually use my Valve Index. Uh, here. Okay. And uh, do you find the um, Valve Index? Let's say, in your opinion, is the best headset uh, for for the money right now on the market, or why you went for the for well index just to discuss the the hardware side of the of VR today in 2020 uh yeah I mean I think the, the I, I'm I'm definitely the most happy with the valve index in terms of its fidelity and you know in terms of best for the money I think the HP reverb as it comes out will probably give the index a good run for its money because the second you're generation you mean. trying to get the quality you know maybe I, I haven't had a chance to try it out yet but um yeah but it and I don't, I, you know, there's people like Ben Lang that I look to in terms of like he's somebody who was really quite interesting, interested in checking out all of the different latest hardware iterations. And I, when I went to CES 2017, that's when I really decided to stop trying to focus so much on the hardware because I feel like, you know, that you, if you've tried enough of the different VR headsets, then you can start to really refine your sense of trying to uh, name all the, the technical nuances of what's happening in the headset. But that's not what I'm necessarily most interested in uh, with with VR. I found that a lot of the hardware interviews that I ended up doing in 2017 uh, didn't you know, rise to the top of different right. stuff that I wanted to talk about immediately. The stuff that I really want to talk about is the content and what, what people are actually doing with it. Because for me, I'm probably the most interested in the philosophical implications of VR as a medium. Like what's it going to mean? What, how's it going to shift yeah. culture? How's it going to change minds? Uh, if you extrapolate out and see this as a, a potential, then where's this all going? And, and 
what could this mean uh, as I sort of focus and meditate on the ultimate potential of VR, then it's really trying to focus on the, the most exalted uh, aspects, but also, you know, at the same time, some of the biggest risks and threats. And so looking at the ethical considerations of privacy, but also like, you know, the black mirror type of scenarios, like, yes. okay, mm -hmm. as this goes out and starts to shift culture in a collective way, then what are some things that we should be aware of? And so it's from that perspective of, of trying to like see where things are going, where you start to map out some of the potential risks and what can we do now to be able to mitigate those risks so that if we look at what's happening in the wide world with all of technology, then we can see like, you know, who would have predicted that the social networking uh, would have become such a large network as to propagate fake news and propaganda and potentially undermine democracy in different ways and, 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 you know, catalyze additional genocides in Myanmar. I mean, there's all sorts of things that are like these unintended consequences that it's difficult when you're first starting to be able to know how things are going to play out. I think and it's so impossible. So there's going to be things that happen yeah. Yeah. with spatial computing and XR that we have no idea until it actually happens. But some of them we may be able to see what's going to happen and maybe we could do something about it. So I feel like part of my role is to, to try to map that out a little bit and have those types of discussions and talk about those things that uh, we should be thinking about and what kind of ethical frameworks and you know what what's our responsibilities as designers and creators to be able to like shift it towards the the more exalted uses rather than kind of unconsciously slip into the dystopic big brother futures that if we don't if we sort of use our existing systems then we kind of will be recreating 1984 or big brother or you know any one of those sort of dystopic novels whether it's ready player one or whatever else we sort of go down a path of post-apocalyptic future that you know we're, uh, we're already partially there yeah, it's i think like the dystopia <laughs> has a, pr a function but there's also a protopia and what what's possible and so i'm i think it's easy to see where things are at now and to extrapolate out into further dystopias but it's harder to say okay how could this actually create a world that works for everybody and this more utopian or protopia that um tries to really address some of these systemic issues and problems and you know what has to happen at a economic cultural uh, technological and architecture as well as the legal and law policy what are all those different components that need to be in place to be able to like shift us in the right direction sure sure and i, I think you know partially we already uh in some sort of like 1984 stuff because we you know we see how fast people give up their privacy uh, in return to free services and stuff which is uh, which is of course um a very troubling business model in general or, or sta state of things, but people got used to it already. So that's very hard to shift uh, shift uh, understanding of people uh, from that to something different. But um, I, I have a hope. I mean, I, I'm absolutely positive about what's what's coming up. And I think humanity, uh, you know, it's always in a trends and, and waves and, you, you know, we'll deal with things. And I, I just only hope that we'll not have to deal with things through going to a very terrible, uh, uh, you know, times. So it's better just to kind of mitigate things uh, up front and then go through maybe some downwards, but not a horrible uh, dive down and deep dive and then uh, going up uh, again. So that's 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 uh, I, I I agree with you. And um, if you if you would, um, kind of just last question on the on the on the uh, direct VR uh, stuff. If you would want to kind of what stood out to you from interviewing and talking to people in the let's say for the last one year period uh, of time what what did you hear and see uh and you said to yourself okay that's something extraordinary or that's something very interesting do you have anything like that um uh in your mind right now what you can share with us well i mean it the last year it takes me all the way back to like pre-coronavirus mm -hmm. and i feel like that you know my last Last in 2019, I went to 18 different places, and it was almost like this sense of like I got to travel all these places. And then, you know, the last place that I had traveled was Sundance in 2020, and that's the last time that I had traveled. Mm -hmm. So then, in February and March was like this new reality that we're all in. Yeah. Um, so I feel like it's it's so hard to compare those two realities because it's like <laughs> the things I was looking at and seeing were a lot of. Um, like the trend was that I would go to these different places and maybe film festivals and I would see stuff that would only could be seen as a location-based entertainment. Like you had to have special hardware and you had to 
you know, be at the place to be able to see it. It's very site specific in that sense. Um, and because a lot of the innovation that's happening when, in the cutting edge of storytelling is is really exploring like haptics and you know social dynamics, right. social mm -hmm. interactions, and you know different stuff that you you don't have as a consumer. So you get to see the types of experiences that are just not accessible because you don't have all the gear that you need. So, but then once the coronavirus hit, then basically all of that is shut down until we have like a vaccine or some way to ensure that we're going to feel safe of putting these things on our faces when, you know, that we have a global pandemic happening. So it's already like you're trying to mitigate your risk and location-based entertainment and putting things on your face that have been on other people's faces is actually like probably a pretty relative to all the things you could be doing a pretty high risk thing yeah. that, you know, do you really want to be risking your life to doing that? I mean, for me, I don't. So, you know, yeah. it, it's like, me neither. even though if it's perfectly safe, there, there could be some, it's not perfectly safe. There's some, some yeah. risk that's in there. So I think that what I've seen after the pandemic was this shift towards, okay, we have all this technology out there, the quest and these PC VR and, and also just the virtual worlds and the 2d version so that, it's accessible to people even if they don't have the hardware. And so if there's one trend that I see, it's the, you know, Rec Room or VR Chat or, you know, these other VR companies, maybe the Wave VR is going to maybe move in this direction where um, you don't have to have a VR headset to get your foot in the door. You're able to experience the virtual world. I don't know, Somni in Space has a 2D version as well. Um, Second Life doesn't have a VR version, but, you know, there's, there's the 2D client I think is, a pretty key part of building enough of a critical mass of a network of people so that it's valuable enough to be able to, to have this network of, uh, it, it increases the value of the network that then increases the value of the virtual world. So um, I'm really interested in what's happening with uh, the open web and WebXR with the decentralized web summit and decentralized web camp, which I've gone to the last couple of years, which, you know, uh, I think you're doing a lot of really interesting experiments here with decentralized architectures here in Somnium space that um, is maybe, you know, leading us towards, uh, you know, we have the, the, the walled gardens and the uh, centralization of, you know, you go to VR chat or you go to the, the platforms like Oculus home or steam or, you know, ways, I mean, steam is probably a lot more decentralized, more democratized, but you can look at like Oculus as a, a pretty good model of this yeah. closed walled garden yeah. approach where they have this vertical, vertical integration from top to bottom. It's a great experience, but yet sometimes for, for getting your foot into the door, the, it's very exclusive and you have to be at a certain level, which then uh, minimizes a lot of diversity that you see. Uh, and you have things like SideQuest that allows people to sort of get access to those. And then, you know, Oculus next year is going to be launching some sort of like, you know, uh, SideQuest equivalent as official channel, likely not charged because that'll be differentiated from the store, but at least to allow the the prototypes and the experimentation to happen. Because if the bar is that it's a certain level, then it really stifles innovation because you're not able to really push the medium forward by by making inc incremental changes because it has to be at a certain level of polish. Uh, so that, that I think is a, an interesting dynamic to see how that plays out and also virtual conferencing and what's it mean to um, replace these conferences that we used to have, how do we still gather and what is the way to set context? What is the way to build relationships? How do you recreate those hallway conversations and, start to spark these moments of serendipity and synchronicity where you're able to have these collisions with people and really, you know, find alignment with your intentions and their intentions and be able to foster collaborations or get your questions answered. Um, a lot of the content that's happening on conferences now is really focused on the talks that have been happening. But for me, <clears throat> it was always more interesting to be roaming around the hallways right. where people were there to see the talks, but they're also committed there because they wanted to connect to the community. Mm -hmm. And it's that type of community connection that would happen in those hallways that was really the heart of my podcast. But now that with the virtual conferences, you sort of, you don't need the hallway and it's actually architecturally very difficult to recreate all the conditions that you <laughs> need to be able to have people gathering in spaces just to, to kind of hang out and talk to each other. So that's, for me, that's some of the things that I find um, some of the most interesting and uh, difficult challenges to solve. Um, and this dialectic between centralization and decentralization and what the, what the economic models are going to be in the future, because, uh, that's, 
there's <laughs> there's a lot of chicken and egg problems within VR, which is that you need to have enough people to have the headsets, but then you need a robust distribution platform and enough content, but you also need the people who are developing the content to be able to fund themselves and to get paid. But then if there's not enough people, then you don't get paid. So then you sort of like have this, like, how do you get out of this chicken and egg issue? And then are you going to use something like surveillance capitalism to bootstrap something uh, of, the, of a new industry and, and have that embedded into uh, a direction that's going to move us more towards a dystopic area rather than a more, you know, with us more data sovereignty yep. and more autonomy and, and autonomy and freedom. Uh, you know, those are big questions that architecturally, uh, if the whole industry is being bootstrapped by an unethical approach of surveillance capitalism that is unsustainable, then we need completely new business models. <laughs> but you have to innovate on the business model on top of innovating. You know, the there's, software, once you start to get yeah. to like too many layers of innovation, then it becomes higher risk and then difficult to actually have yeah. people that are able to push the needle forward. So there's a lot of, a lot of larger economic issues that are there, but also content wise that I, I think is, is really, quite interesting. I feel like Somnian Space actually is sort of on that area of trying to innovate on in different ways, but you know, how to actually catalyze enough momentum around some of these philosoph philosophically driven ideas to be to be able to like, you know, create new models. And so um, yeah, I mean over time challenge. I'm more interested in seeing how that's been playing out. But those are there's some some very relevant issues there that I think are ad actually addressing some pretty key problems that I see that are in the industry and then you know in the short term it's like you know developers need to get paid and the people need to be able to make a viable middle class living in the medium uh, but yep. right now it's sort of like feast or famine and either you win the lottery and even if you win the lottery there's like multiple lotteries you have to win you know just to get access and get out there um, so yeah it's it's uh, for me it's it's fascinating to kind of trace the evolution uh and i have no idea how it's all going to play out but it's uh it, there's a lot of very important um, experiments that even if they don't cross the chasm and make it big there there could be seeds of insights that they're doing that may be useful to document and record and to for people to pick up those threads later when the time is right because a lot of this is timing so when, when is the right time for different things so we've seen a lot of things that have come and gone but it's like coming up with the right mixture of everything at the right time is yeah. like it's, the it's, grand it's, mystery it's, of what it's it hard. It's hard. To, it's hard to to know. But I think we we all, at least in Somnium, we you know we believe that this is the long run thing. It's again, it's not a marathon. There's no you know there's no uh, let's say this was not created to sell it off in five years for two billion dollars to you know like Microsoft or something. Or it's it, this is the long run world trying to create new society, new economy, new ways of interacting with each other and stuff like that. So um, I think if someone wants to build something in VR and you're totally right, it, it, you have to be patient and you have to kind of think far away from uh, uh, from from today, uh, from today's day. So um, that's uh, that, that, that's that's true. And uh, we're fully aware of that um, as a company. Uh, yeah. The, the other thing that I would say is that it, it doesn't make good economic sense for a lot of people to do it. So I think a lot of people are driven by this vision of Passion, yeah. wanting to participate in something larger than themselves and to help create yes. a new future that you yeah. know they've seen in these sci-fi depictions. Uh, and it, it seems to be like this Wild West pioneering innovation spirit. And that, that's what I think also I find so interesting about this community is that they are driven by this vision of the future that doesn't exist yet. And they may be able to help to create that and come up with key innovations and building blocks for other people. And so it's, you know, I'm, I'm very interested in this uh, concept of prospography, which is the, what is the story of a community that, that, you know, like as, as much as I can of taking like these sample interviews uh, over the years, 1500, it's a, like a small sample of maybe 1% of a larger community that is trying to get some representation to see, okay, what are the common themes of this, this group of people that have, despite all odds and all rational reasons for why they're involved in this, they still are pushing forward and continue to innovate. And I think that that type of pioneering spirit in this drive to innovate and discover something that isn't hasn't happened yet uh, is is at the what I see is at the heart of a lot of people that are involved in the industry right now. And that Absolutely. to me is is fascinating because it's it's like they're uh, just to, to get their story and what what sort of um, puzzle piece of the insight they have. 
from their expertise and everybody has those puzzle pieces and i like to think of like the the old uh, adage of you know 100 men and women with their hand on an elephant and you know they can only see the one part of that elephant but if everybody sort of talks together then they can get a big picture of what this is and that's that's what this kind of feels like is like this this future that is unknown but people have like a small puzzle piece and insight that Mm -hmm. uh, just needs to kind of all coalesce and come together and and my part of my intention is to sort of just have those conversations and to help cross pollinate those nuggets of insight and information as people have been diving in uh, so that they could glean a little bit of uh, an insight that that maybe helps unlock other potentials that really require this social process of the community coming together to uh, build something that would be impossible if only one person was doing it. Yeah, I I have to agree with you, and uh, you know, everything we do here comes from passion side. I've you know I've had to start the company and fund it myself in the beginning because nobody would even believe in the, doing something like that, and. I just had this vision, you know, being in virtual worlds for 20 years, I just had to say, look, VR is the new medium and VR is actually allowing us to be on the other side of the monitor and I want to be there. I, I, I have to build it. So that's that's kind of what's the thinking. Um, and it still is. So that's that's the, that's kind of amazing. And I, I see many people as you uh, right in our community in, in VR builders, let's say, uh, they're just driven by passion um, first. And that's, that's amazing. And, and that leads me to a question. What is, what is the the metaverse for you because you know we, we, we you and me we, we hang out with some same people and we talk to same people and you know we all have different discussions and maybe a slightly different opinion when 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 you say the metaverse how do you see the metaverse play out i always ask this question here on this show do you think it is a you know the metaverse will be or social vr will be dominated by one two companies in the in the future or do you see a metaverse as an interoperability of different experiences like somnium vr chat you know outspace and other uh, what what is what is it in your opinion let's say if we talk about the next 10 years for example yeah you know i when i did an interview with vlad pasivic who is one of the founders <coughs> of uh, webgl and the early creators of web vr he said you know the metaverse already exists and it's the internet. It's just in 2D. Um, so I think that's true. But at the same time, I did an interview with Tim Sweeney back, I think, in 2015 or so. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the things he's the you know founder of Epic. And he said, you know, a lot of this sci fi literature about the metaverse was written before gaming has really evolved to the point of it is today with the MMOs. But also, you know, each world is kind of like this self-contained metaverse. And so. I like to look at Fortnite as like this, you know, potential future of, you know, uh, uh, an experience where you have the ability to see it on all the different platforms. Uh, so whatever platform is platform agnostic, you can have access to any one of the VR headsets. And so it's not exclusive to one headset. But, um, you know, and just in the nature of talking this, we it's difficult to talk about it without the dialectic between the closed walled gardens versus the open ecosystems. And I think that the metaverse is going to be a little bit of both. There's going to be things like the Facebook horizons that are out there that may be a little bit more insular. Or maybe there's links outward. Because um, if we look at the internet, the hypertext link was the heart of what makes the, the web so valuable. And I did an early interview with uh, Philip Rosedale. And you know the thing he said is that Metcalf's law is the idea that a communications network's value is calculated by the number of nodes that are in that network. And so you can think about that in terms of like telephones and people have phone numbers and the more people that have phone numbers, it's more valuable. But you can also think about it on the web as a hypertext link. The more that you're able to link to other worlds and, and other, uh, I mean, websites and, and get access to it, then uh, Google has made a living off of, you know, uh, trying to digest the yeah. entire social graph and then see how uh, people are voting by by linking that then uh, drives these uh, the the search engine results but um you know there's i i like to think about like this the equivalent of like if you go into a world am i able to go into other worlds uh am i able to link off into these other worlds and so it's like the early days of yahoo yahoo where they would say like oh here's all the new websites and you would sort of go off and then that uh, Doc Searles is, uh, you know, the Clue Train Manifesto uh, and that those whole crew of folks were would talk about like and really to build influence would be to point people towards the most valuable thing. So recognizing that you're limited in what you can create in your like little world or, or website or whatever you create and that 
you can gain power and influence by pointing people in the direction to see uh, what is the most interesting thing, even if it's not something that you've created. And so I think the tendency for a lot of these virtual worlds is to be pretty insular and to uh, not make it easy to go from one world to the next. And there's a lot of issues that need to be worked out in terms of identity and self-sovereign identity and the persistence of avatar representations. Because if you have something like Rec Room, as an example, where if you have a hat and your identity and all your clothes, if that is the basis of the economic uh, foundations, then there's literal to no incentive to have people to take all those assets that they've bought in the rec room world and be able to have them have access to them in other worlds as well. On the first because, glance, you know, I guess. Maybe there's a, there's a, you know, that I, but I think that's that those different types of problems of self-sovereign identity, the persistence of identity across those different worlds and how do you blend those together? I think that, um, a lot of things that have been happening with the early days of Janus uh, and, you know, James Bacchanayo doing a lot of really amazing uh, engineering work to be able to start to do that. Uh, there's the Metaverse Makers Mixer that have been being inspired by things like VRChat and trying to build, build out like higher end avatar representations and, you know, ways in which that you could use uh, uh, the WebAssembly and uh, the new sort of binary compiling to be able to get the performance of the native, but to be able uh, of the of the native application, but to be able to do that in a way that allows you to seamlessly go into these, between these different worlds. And like I said, like uh, your avatar right now is like all of the business models are preventing that from really taking off because there's like I said, little to no incentive to make that happen. I think it's going to come from the web VR, web XR. Um, in the the open web uh, and potentially you know places that have a little bit more decentralized approach like some in space and maybe there's some some of the cryptocurrency approaches to be able to uh, declare that you actually own this object and ways to be able to verify that and um, but yeah there <laughs> all that stuff on the back end for how you actually manage that um, who owns what and who has authority and you know your identity across these different areas and making sure that you could potentially declare that this is actually me because I have this cryptographic signature. Mm -hmm. So all those things, um, uh, I guess experientially, everything is, a, is the walled garden works better uh, right now. And it's more of fragmented where it it would be difficult to go from WebXR to some in space to alt space to VR chat. I mean, there's some ways that you can do a single path, but you can't uh, bilaterally go backwards for some of these. Like there are ways to sort of jump between those different worlds, but to seamlessly go back and forth and to maintain your identity in a group of people, like you do world hopping in VR chat or other, other like uh, Sansar or Second Life, you know, be able to sort of jump in between different places with different people. Uh, that that type of experience I think is, is maybe gonna be the catalyst to be able to figure out some of the more difficult architectural challenges to be able to actually like facilitate the persistence of identity across the virtual worlds. Yeah, I, th I think, I think, you know, we are, we're, uh, I personally think that the, the holy grail of, of experience for, for people, um, at least in the next five years or 10 years, even maybe, um, uh, it's a combination of, uh, of decentralized and centralized approach, like this wall garden, but allowing certain things, uh, to go and be decentralized and kind of more working towards the centralized future while still you know you know being centralized in some respect to be able to provide quality experience now that's that's at least my view of that and uh, i think we as somebody we try to push hard on 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 the on on some you know decentralization of economy for example right the identity and and ownership and stuff but yet we also realize that experience has to be has to be good and people have to have you know fun here so we try to keep this this approach and we think about a centralization even of the ser server side right so we we think about how we are going to make it in a way that whatever happens in the future to you know to us to the company to whatever so that the, the experience can still run um even without us kind of uh, propelling it um but we're talking 10 years away where we're you know at this moment they have to be centralized service and they have to be centralized um, kind of uh, not authority, but the centralized entity, which which provides those services to, to people in order to actually execute the centralized economical uh, activities, for example, like we do here. So it, it is in a mix. It's it's in a mix. And 
I, I think uh, many people here think that uh, when when I when I interview like for example Alvin Van Dryden, he said uh, from HEC, you know, he said to us that he thinks it will be dominated by one or two players, like you know Facebook did and stuff. Um, I personally think that uh, I I hope. Let me s reiterate. I hope that the future of metaverse is many different experiences like you named, right? Like VR chat, Wave, uh, you know, Outspace and stuff. And, and being able to um, have economical incentives to go from one to another. I personally think that uh, on the first glance, yes, for Somnium or for any other company, it doesn't make sense to let people go outside of the, of the experience. But that's just on the first glance. I have a totally different opinion. I'm, I'm happy if I'm allowing people to seamlessly go to other experience. I would hope that other experience will allow to go back, but I'm even fine if I'm allowing people to go and say, look, I'm going to explore a party in VR chat, but then I'm coming back to Somnium to, you know, to do some, uh, some uh, hangout with, hangouts with my friends, and then I'm going to you know, Outspace for another event. That's the future I want to see. And f at least from some new space, that's the future we will support, uh, and we will we will try to be as open as possible to any kind of cooperation uh, from other companies. Um, and I don't think it makes us more vulnerable. I, I just think it's just a, a different aspect of how to look at things uh, right now. So that's that's at least our our vision of how things could evolve, and we try to support that vision. Um, yeah, and uh, just to sort of follow on one point there, because uh, I do think that there's this dialectic between the centralization and decentralization and going to the decentralized web camp and summit, I'm talking to a lot of these people who are trying to build the architectures of a decentralized future. And the challenge that I think is like culturally, it's like, it's like a worse experience yes. uh, for people. So it's hard to buy, to get buy-in to be able to continue to foster something like a decentralized architectures because it, it just, the centralized systems have economies of scale and it's just you know a, a more coherent experience you can look at the difference between epic and unreal versus something like uh, webxr and you can see that you know mo 95 to 99 percent of the vr industry is using those centralized tools because the experience is so much greater um but i think the so there, there's a deeper question there of like what what is it going to be the catalyst to sort of invest in these decentralized architectures because uh, I feel like there's that's an antidote to surveillance capitalism and a lot of these things. But, you know, I, I have this interview I did with uh, Vince Cerf back in 2018 at the Decentralized Web uh, 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 Summit that I reference all the time where it's like he I was like saying then, like, why why don't we why doesn't Google sort of do something different than surveillance capitalism? And his his point was like, well, you know, first of all, there's economies of scale that just makes it cheaper and more efficient, but also you know, how would you pay for giving free access to all of this human knowledge to everyone in the world for free? Um, how do you sustain that? And so it's like the way to sustain it is through these platform cooperatives and people that are actually like either taking money from taxes and the government or investing money from as a collective. It's it's like trying to invest the or, or people have co-ownership of those platforms Um and it's that platform cooperatism where you have co-ownership of that platform to really push it forward that <clears throat> is the model. But, you know, how do you get people to actually sort of buy in and, and build that architecture when the economies of scale are so much better and easier? And experientially, you take a hit on, like, it having more friction and more difficult to sustain. And just, it, like, there's more uh, more friction. And at this point, there's no thing that's really catalyzing people to really invest in those decentralized architectures. And so when the coronavirus hit and with the COVID-19 and you had the global pandemic and, you know, if it continues, then we may start to see the brittleness of those economies of scale that starts to shut down supply lines for things that are no longer available because you don't have the same type of ease of, or the economies of scale are changed and different because things yep. are shut down. And so what I expect from uh, this dialectic between the centralization and decentralization is that, um, you know, in some country, the places where decentralization has really taken off is when people have rolling blackouts with their uh, their their power or the internet, and then they need to be able to get access to the internet when they have it, so that they can download it and have it offline. And so it's offline first. So you assume that you're going to have intermittent power or internet, and then you design the system around that. And so you have different architectural decisions where it becomes less important to have like a timestamp of 
you know, NTP servers is a thing with like having consistent timestamps. Well, it's less important to have the when things happen. It's just you take it when it's available and mm -hmm. you just make sure you have the latest update because uh, in that type of model and mindset, it may start to have with what's happening with maybe the, the coronavirus, if we do start to have power outages or uh, less reliable internet services because of the brittleness uh, or there's, uh, you know, DDoS attacks that sort of take down half of the internet, right. it's going to take a lot of the centralized systems failing before people feel like they need to build resilience through the decentralized systems because you, you have a lot of resilience for the decentralized systems, but it, it's, it's harder and it's a worse experience and there's a lot of challenging uh, things to be able to make it work. And you also have to have the culture of having what I think of like a mesh network of everybody like if, if I were to go away from a centralized ISP, that would mean that I would need to collaborate with my community and everybody within the community would have some responsibility of, of either becoming a system, system administrator themselves or having sort of a, 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 a cryptocurrency that sustains and pays for yeah. those people to be those system administrators. Yeah. So there's, you know, models where people, rather than paying a centralized ISP, they're paying sort of like these cryptocurrency taxes that then uh, are sustaining more of a community driven approach. But you know, that is happening in rural or in, in rural areas where the ISPs have said, it doesn't make sense for us to Include give you internet, internet service. Yeah. And so people are left to fend from themselves. And so I think VR actually is going to be a catalyst for these decentralized systems because you have things like alt for like uh, VR chat where you can only have like 50 people in the room, which means that you have a lot more of like in order to go to find where the cool party is, you have to be a part of the network. We're just starting to build those bottom up grassroots um uh, you know, networks of people where the people who are connected to the most people are going to have access to the best experiences. And it's not going to be like now where you go to Google and do a search engine results in a centralized system. It's going to be like, what kind of peer network do I have that's going to be able to give me access to things that can, I can only go to because I'm connected to this community right. of people. And I think that as a model is that that type of uh, decentralized systems are starting to be built out. And then eventually that will get onto our, you know, physical architecture of the internet itself, but, and also decentralized systems to be able to kind of really, really foster and catalyze these, these different models. So that's at least what I see where things are at now, but that we really need that catalyst to be able to see like, you know, a problem to be solved, like in response to the failures of the centralized systems. I, I had recently, um, uh, like I think a month ago, an experience where I, I'm Czech, in Czech Republic, right? And I have um, I have an internet and home phone and mobile phone, everything from Weta phone. So they, they, they provide the whole uh, holistic experience. And I must say it's really good. Um, but what happened is uh, one of the data centers of Weta phone uh, on the inbound uh, channel for internet into Czech Republic, uh, which covers 50% of the, uh, of the uh, you know, geographical map of Czech Republic but with internet and mobile phones, um, the power there was a power outage and the the backup system didn't run on so what happened is 50 percent of czech republic suddenly was completely blacked out for internet mobile phones and landlines and that wow. that was pretty big because you know at first you don't realize what's happening because you're like ah internet is out like okay i have my you know i have my 20 gigs of, of data no problem you take the phone phone is off but not only the mobile data off the completely you know everything is shut down and you're like wait a second that's something is happening so you kind of start you know thinking like okay what do you do um and since you are reliant on one provider then when you st you start to think like okay what if i'd had like a satellite internet right uh, what what does it cost you kind of go and research things and 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 you start to realize but again it was for six hours and then they 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 um they put all back, uh, all things back, and everything was fine until then. So it was not enough catalyst to actually start thinking about uh, things, but definitely a, a good uh, bell ring in terms of thinking about decentralized uh, access to the internet. What happens if, right? Okay, so uh, maybe uh, let's dive out of VR a little bit into one topic I wanted to discuss with you, and we discussed it uh, like almost two years ago already in the first version of Somnium, if you remember. We dived deep into the UFOs uh, at that time, and there were recently some 
happenings in the UFO uh, scene. You know, uh, we had uh, Bob Lazar interview with Joe Rogan, right? We had the movie about him. I don't know if you if you follow. I'm pretty sure you are. Uh, we had we had some you know American pilots coming out again and saying you know yeah we see those things there. We don't understand what they are. Um, what do you follow it? Uh, what what is your take on, on on that? Like, what are we? Do you believe in what Bob Lazar is saying, for example? How do you how do you process that? Uh, so Bob Lazar. Well, first to take a step back. Um, the in December seventeenth, two thousand seventeen, there was a report in the New York Times that really talked that talked about the Nimitz encounter uh, that had a pilot, um, Dave Fravor, and a number of different radar, and so. The most reliable evidence of UFOs uh, has like basically been validated. And by the way, my, my this arm, my my controller <laughs> turned uh, off because you, you look ran good. out of the battery. So I, if I have one arm, um, but uh, so the I, I've been interested in the UFO topic since the X Files. I, I would watch the X Files, and I guess you know the I, I lean towards this this desire to to like want to believe. But um, so I'd be sort of like paying attention to the UFO community. And there was a buzz about Tom DeLonge back in October of 2017, I guess, he to the Stars Academy announced, and they like pulled out all these former, uh, uh, <laughs> there's uh, CIA and uh, you know people who basically were in the know in terms of this, uh, this issue of UFO. And so it seemed like, and, and then there was a, a UFO researcher named Grant Cameron that I watched, and he said, you know, this is a like Tom DeLong is a part of this official disclosure process. Like he, this is vetted. This is like something to pay attention to. And then so he came out and made this big announcement in October, and then uh, Leslie Kane uh, is a journalist and she covered it at the time uh, for Huffington Post, but then it basically didn't go anywhere for mm -hmm. a, a while up until December when the New York Times was vetting it and reporting on it and basically did this big. You know, story on it that that basically opened up the discussion for UFOs. Now, the challenge with UFOs is that there's little to no hard evidence in terms of like physical evidence of this, and there's a lot of uh, eyewitness accounts that go back for millennia. But probably the most uh, reliable evidence is both like a military pilot being able to see this tic tac that happened in, in 2004, mm -hmm. the Nimitz encounter on top of radar returns from multiple yeah. perspectives. And so cameras, yeah. you have radar returns that that gives it to another level of empirical evidence. And from the Navy's perspective, they were like, there was a taboo of even reporting it and talking about it. Yeah, uh, They would get a lot of blowback. And so there's been a movement of trying to increase the reporting guidelines and people to at least to be able to talk about it and to break the taboos that have been there for, you know, for years and, you know, Likely because there's been a lot of concerted effort to to uh, attack what are uh, been called conspiracy theories as you know people that you know, if you believe them then you are uh, you know just it should be shamed because you're kind of like the gold yeah. standard of pseudoscience in that sense. But but there's been quite a shift over the last couple of years, and I have been tracking it. Um, and there's a range of theories of what's happening, and that they range from you know that these are unique uh experiences that that's it and to, all the way to that there's been crashed ufos at roswell and that we've got ufo hardware that's being kept secret and there's alien bodies you know uh lazar came out and he's basically on that area of saying yes i've been working on reverse engineering uh ufos and there's enough issues with the story that it's inconclusive you know it's it's like okay yeah i might want to believe it but there's not enough corroborating evidence. Could to you could you could you point, point out to me? Because I mean, I I, lo I watched his interview, several of those, and he's he's absolutely mesmerizingly um, non. How to say it? He's not excited about he what he's saying. In the same time, he's a very conclusive and repetitive in what he's saying all all over the years. He didn't gain any, uh, gain anything. I think he lost a lot by saying this stuff. He didn't get any, you know, he didn't become super popular or sell, sold uh, tons of books. He just continues to repeat the same thing. And the things he's saying make sense. And what actually supports his evidence is that they, they, they filmed those things, you know, uh, uh, going from the Area uh, 51, right? Uh, and, and just wh wh why do you think he's not enough uh, conclusive in, in what he's saying? Well, it's a, so, I mean, like, there may be a part of me that wants to believe all of Lazar's story. But when you look at 
this issue and try to take approach of um, what is what is truth, what is knowledge, and how do you um, how do you know what is true, and how do you get the larger collective to be convinced that's true? There's not enough evidence to co collect like the most diehard skeptics because this is an extraordinary claim, and if you're going to make extraordinary claims, you need some extraordinary evidence. You need like some hard proof, and there's been no hard proof other than his story and um, you know there's the 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 witnessing of the the UFOs uh, or these these objects, whatever they were, flying. But I think, you know, it, it, th this is a larger issue that I guess has in the UFO community right now has come up with the uh, Wilson Davis uh, memo that uh, Stephen Greer is uh, somebody who has uh, been really arguing and pushing for disclosure for a long, long time. He's he makes a lot of grand claims, uh, but he claimed that he had a meeting with uh, – Dr. Edgar Mitchell, Apollo astronaut, as well as Will Miller, went to go meet with like uh, Admiral Wilson in the Pentagon back in 1997. And Greer was like, look, uh, there are unacknowledged special access programs that have uh, UFO, uh, <laughs> like the, the U.S. is reverse engineering UFOs, but they've uh, made it in a secrecy structure that they're unacknowledged special access programs that are black, that you have to be a, like one of 12 people or a dozen people on the or you know on the bigot list in order to get access to it and so they went to the uh, one of the j2s of the defense intelligence agency and was like hey we we uh we, there's a program that exists where there's private corporations that are reverse engineering ufo technology and uh you don't have access to it and so the story goes that admiral Tom Wilson tried to get access and then he went and tried to talk to the lawyers uh, and the people trying to get access to this, you know, reverse engineering uh, initiative. And they said, you know, you got to go back to the special access overview committee and, you know, we're denying you access. And then it came back that uh, the review committee said, no, you're not going to have access. You don't have a need to know about this. Um, and people have looked at it. They're saying, well, he was in part of intelligence and this, this was actually an R and D. So he didn't actually have oversight ability. Uh, but the idea is that like, you have to be, uh, for unacknowledged special access programs, they're compartmentalized to be able to separate this out. So there's a secrecy structure that would, you know, like prevent the, the, the president of the United States, if he wanted to get to it, it sort of claimed that he wouldn't even get access to it. So these Wilson Davis documents uh, are, are out there. And what happened was Eric Davis in 2002 met with Tom Wilson and Tom Wilson said, yes, this did happen. I tried to get access. And it was a little bit of a, a dance back and forth where Tom Wilson had security clearances, but he was giving information to Eric Davis to go back to the uh, the NIDS, which is the National Institute for Discovery Science, the Bob Bigelow's effort to be able to um, potentially look into this and have some leads to be able to to try to track down if this actually exists. Um, so there's people like Richard Dolan, other people saying this Wilson Davis memo is like the leak of the century that's leading towards. Uh, evidence that there's a, a reverse engineering program, and this is like the biggest evidence that we have so far. So let's like, if we take a step back in the UFO community uh, and just in general with fake news, there's like, what do you believe, and how do you know what's true? Um, I'm and there's a Agnes Callard who's talked about um, Socrates and uh, how knowledge it really requires uh, this adversarial. Uh, relationship and what the way she sort of describes this argument is that you know you need you want to believe truths so there's truths that are true but you have to have some sort of just uh, a belief is like a uh, knowledge comes from like justified true belief that's like one form of, of of knowledge so you have facts and evidence to be able to justify your beliefs so it, you sort of inductively extrapolate from the evidence that's mm -hmm. there but then you want to also avoid falsehoods so you don't want to like take a fact and extrapolate a wrong belief. And so you have to, at the same time, believe truths and avoid falsehoods. And what Agnes Callard says is that those are actually two completely different algorithms to believe truths and avoid falsehoods. And that in order to um, you know, come to the truth, you should have this adversarial division of labor where one person's arguing for and one person's arguing against. Sort of like in order to have justice, you have to have the uh, prosecution of the guilty and the acquittal of the innocent. So it's actually two separate processes that you need to have cooperating together in order to achieve justice. Well, just the same, in order to get to truths and knowledge, 
you have to have the skeptics who are not believing this uh, premise that you're putting forth, and they're trying to, to bring it down. They're saying, okay, we'll see some evidence to really convince us. And then people are putting forth uh, their belief, uh, and you you try to you know work have a, a peer review process where you try to get towards some knowledge and some truths. The challenge is that you have a lot of belief, but not a lot of the evidence to sort of falsify or prove it one way or another. So until we have the government come out and say, yes, uh, Roswell did happen, here's the UFO uh, crash, and to, for us to look at it and to see you know, metamaterials or whatever that's in there that's beyond our capacity to really understand or comprehend. Um, you know, Lazar was claiming that there was element 115, which is not a stable element. Uh, so that would potentially be some evidence that, you know, this but, came from off world. Uh, but it came out you know, to be true, right? These I mean, different they, they types discovered of it. Potential they... things that have never been produced. So until the hard evidence is produced that whether that's meta materials, which the Two Stars Academy has, or whatever it ends up being, until we see that hard evidence, then the skeptics who uh, have a center of gravity of suspended judgment so they're suspending their judgment until they have more proof or more discussion you know you can believe not believe or suspend your judgment and a good skeptic will have suspended judgment to be able to to talk to people who who are believing something uh but there's a dialectic process that you know that needs to be in co cooperation and collaboration i think that's the biggest thing in the ufo community is that you don't have that adversarial division of epistemic labor this collaboration where the skeptics are collaborating with the believers it's like becomes a turf war of like either you believe it or you're an idiot or if you believe that you know this document or what then you've gone way too far so philosophically it's sort of interesting because it's like what do you believe uh and what is the standard for proof and belief um and while i may personally believe some stuff i can't prove what i everything that i believe and so even though i i think likely the wilson davis documents are true and that it may may be pointing to it until there's further evidence until there's a vetting of it being reported by the mainstream journalists then i sort of reserve i'm in a, a state of suspended judgment so but, i'm actually suspending my judgment without fully believing until i find more evidence but but here i have to i have to say like um when you say i'll wait and you as you know the person who makes a lot of research and i, I remember your twitter feed and uh, you know you did a long tweet about ufos and all the evidence and stuff and i think when you say now i'll spend my judgment and i'll wait until mainstream journalists will uh will report on that with all the respect to mainstream journalists i think you have uh in many cases much more information and knowledge about certain topics um and I would certainly say you don't need to suspend any judgment in terms of you having research in your hands, or at least you've done a thorough research on the topic uh, that you might actually be in a position to actually not not to dictate the judgment, but to 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 kind of uh, be in the front of that and and just saying, okay, I think and I believe in that because this and this and that, uh, rather than waiting for some journalists who might or not even do that research uh, that deep uh, into to to actually dig into it. So that's just my my kind of view uh, in, in, into that. Well, it, what's interesting is that the the UFO Twitter and the UFO community is like the fringe conspiracy area where they are willing to believe more things before it's actually sort of right, vetted. Right, right. Um, so what what has been interesting about this story is that this has been a topic that I've personally been believing in for a long time and, and thought there was compelling evidence. But now all of a sudden, the standards for evidence have raised, been raised to the point where mainstream journalists uh, like Leslie Keen, who you know is now reporting for the New York Times, Ralph Blumenthal, Brian Bender, um, you know, Tyler Rogaway from, uh, and then Lieutenant uh, Tim McMillan, uh, you know, there's uh, uh, John Greenwald, Black Vault, and all these sort of people, uh, Danny Silva and uh, UFO Joe Merja, uh, people that are <clears throat> more on the fringes and more on the mainstream. And this is a topic that a lot of the fast innovation can happen where they get more things wrong, but they, they actually are, get some things right. And so, then some of those things that get right eventually get vetted by this <clears throat> peer review process. Like there's an editorial process, there's fact checking, there's an editorial process. And so some of these issues, you will only have these sources talk to people who, if you're like a mainstream journalist right. from a right. major That's, publication. Yeah. <clears throat> because there's security clearances, it's a secret issue. So, I mean, at the heart of it, it's like the secrecy um, versus, you know, getting the information out there. Um, and <clears throat> yeah, I mean, part of me thinks that like 
there may be some good reasons for why it's secret because it, in the, uh, I, if, if this exists, mm -hmm. what it means is that <clears throat> there's some sort of exotic technology that is able to bend the nature of space-time in a way that maybe yeah. expands our knowledge about what the nature of reality Absolutely. is. Absolutely. I mean, that's what I'm fundamentally interested in, the philosophical implications of like, okay, what is the, what, what is the interpretation of the, the quantum mechanics that they're using in order to get to this, you know, uh, g the theory of general relativity that allows people to reverse, to basically engineer the space-time metric that would allow the bending of space-time to be able to have ships come here from another, you know, uh, galaxy. Yeah. You know, that there's a lot of the theoretical physics from Eric Davis and Hal Putoff that they've been coming up with what the physics equations are. And their conclusions is that, you know, it's within the bounds of general relativity that a lot of these things are actually operating. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that, that's and one that uh, you don't need to have a new physics that it's actually, if you use like the, the quantum flux and get this sort of negative energy gen density combined with, uh, or an exotic material that's able to bend space-time, then you could get the types of behaviors that enable to observe. And that, that's um, what's make so the Bob Lazar thing so compelling is, be compelling is because, you know, what he says, uh, he predicted the, you know, the element 115, right? And, and, and now it's it's there. People were able to, to get some sort of that uh, and they, they add it into the periodic table. But like what, what makes it amazing is that what he says is actually physically makes sense right you you can as you say you can kind of understand how it works and that what make made me really you know um, um amazed by by his story is that actually nothing he says is something which we cannot process by our brains and our uh, understanding of physics uh, and space and time and, and and that's really interesting that's that's something which uh which which again uh, mesmerizes me when I when I uh, hear his interest. I'm, I'm not a like huge fan. I believe that we are. I mean, it's theoretically, we are not <coughs> alone here because just statistically, it cannot be, uh, or most probably, it's not. Uh, we are not alone there. But of course, we can be in different times and uh, time zones, and we never can reach each other. For example, that's another reason. But yeah, that's what made me really listen uh, to 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 Bob and just uh, try to process what he's saying. Yeah, I'm. You know, I'm hesitant. I mean, the, the thing about this Bob Lazar story uh, is that there's enough things that he either is not telling the full truth about or had to lie about, like, or his 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 or, uh, education history. And it's, it, you know, there's parts of me that uh, likes the Bayesian probability of, like, you know, there's things that can be true and untrue at the same time. Uh, just because somebody, you know, lied about something doesn't mean that it didn't actually happen, or maybe there was a whole erasing of his, his history. There's enough problems with this story, though, and a, and a lack of, um, I mean, there's journalists like George Knapp that have corroborated different things, and then, you know, the the documentaries that have come out, and Jeremy Corb Corbell has looked into various things, but again, the standard for evidence, it's an extraordinary claim, you need some extraordinary evidence. And at this point, there's not enough extraordinary evidence to sort of pass the peer review process at a okay. wider cultural level. All right. So it's not an, a story that I'm interested in trying to get at. Um, and you know, for me, I'm maybe more interested in the philosophical aspects of the story rather than sort of digging in and trying to figure out how to push the story forward. Like maybe that's not my role. My role is to maybe step back and to look at the larger picture and just kind of trace this sort of history as it's coming out, if this ends up being true. I mean, one of the things that Stephen Greer has ar argued is that it, there's certain aspects of, like, if these things exist, they have to have some sort of exotic energy. And if what this means, and, and this is what a lot of Hal, Hal Putoff and, and also Eric Davis have looked at, and also there's been some Navy patents that uh, start to explore this, but there's new exotic ways of having what would essentially be like this uh, free energy devices. And so there'd be ways of, um, and, and this is a, I think an ethical and moral issue, which is that if there was say an alternative fossil fuel fuels, like a new energy source that was infinite, then what would happen if you were to release that into the oh, culture? Yeah, that's, that's you would just, be essentially yeah. releasing the power of a nuclear weapon to everybody in the world. Yeah. Would you, or are we mature enough to be able to handle that? Uh, yeah, exactly. I think that's one of the reasons of maybe that's still not being mainstream. And maybe, and I, this is just some crazy theory, and I've read uh, some articles about that, is that, you know, maybe there is a path where government or some, I don't know, whatever, whoever has um, an ability to access those things right now, it's like prepare the humanity towards that revelation, right? A relation. So, like, 
you know, the movies, the, the articles, the leaks and all those things are maybe slowly but steadily uh, pushing us towards that, that reality. And once the whole narrative is being basically pushed and we're mentally ready to, to absorb that information and the society is ready in terms of, you know, economical activities and, and, and a dem democracy and all those things, that the society is ready to absorb that. And I think that's, that may be the case, uh, but I, it's also, on the other hand, hard to believe that um, someone in a kind of a dark society has such a huge power without ever having it leak to someone or, uh, you know, having it shown uh, something to outside world. So that's always the debate between, like, can it be true? Of course it can, but then on the other hand, can it be true that it never leaked before? Hard to believe. So, yeah. Yeah, it, you get a lot of people within the UFO community that are really pushing for disclosure. Um, but there's a risk there that, you know, if this exists uh, and it has happened, then, you know, that would basically be the biggest story of our of all yes. of humanity's history. Yeah, that, no, nothing matters. You know, nothing and, else matters. <laughs> it's like it, yeah, it would basically song. potentially be so disruptive as to sort of rip apart the normal fabric of society. The normal fabric of society is already being ripped apart by the, the COVID-19 and coronavirus. And so then you're going to sort of add one more thing to <laughs> yeah, that, which is, oh, by the way, uh, we, have, <laughs> we have evidence of crash <laughs> UFOs for over 50 years and we've been keeping it secret. But you know, there's been uh, studies by like the Brookings Institute that looked into like, uh, what would happen to society if you s would announce this? And so, you know, there's uh, there's been like there's an emoji for an alien head in, in UFOs now. So there's it's enough within the popular culture that, you know, over the last like 50 or 60 years since you know, 1947 when alleged Roswell happened. But you still have this this scenario where um, it could be totally disruptive uh, if this exists and you have what is a, a equivalent of a magical silver bullet to be able to solve all of our inner, our problems around energy hmm. and global. I mean, if we had this exotic energy source, you could like reverse the effects of global warming because you could, yeah, sure. you could do enough remediation of the earth and you could basically, why would we need to work if we would be able to have the ability to grow our own food? And like if energy, if you wouldn't have to charge money for, for energy, it would sort of completely undermine yeah. the whole economic system. And so, yeah. Um, it, it would be totally disruptive. And so part of the theory is goes is that people who are in charge of the fossil fuels and that existing economic establishment would not want this out there. But there would be so much potential benefit, but it would be so disruptive. And it could also, like the metaphor I think of, is that if it's an energy source that's the equivalent of giving everybody in the world a nuclear weapon, then we're actually not ethically and morally mature enough to be able to handle that. I mean, we would just completely destroy the Earth even more than we have already right. if we have, we have no boundedness to right. what we would be able to do to ex extract resources. And so it's a, it becomes a more of a, a, an issue of consciousness of like trying to evolve our consciousness so that we're mature enough to be able to handle something like yeah, that. We, we need, we, we need the third party the to world, come into the world. Weapon. Yeah. We need, we need the third party, the aliens to actually comment and, and, and teach us stuff, right. Rather than us discovering and trying to distribute it through all the uh, countries in the world, <laughs> because that, that will not go well. Uh, and I think some wars can uh, can immediately erupt uh, on, on that basis. But yeah, it's 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 a, it's an interesting and a difficult and um, exciting topic. Um, but I think there there is still some time for us to to, to be in the dark, let's say, uh, and we'll we'll be uh, in the dark for some time to for that to happen. Yeah, and it, for me, it's an interesting thought experiment. I mean, these are yeah. sort of they're they're interesting problems. You know, if this existed, then what would need to happen? And then if you assume it exists, then you continue to do the thing that needs to happen. Like I feel like VR coming back to VR is like has the potential to be able to help evolve our consciousness and mm -hmm. to be able to, you know, help train us to be able to how to be in deeper relationship with each other. I mean, there's so much that's happening in the world where the the social media is able to bring forth these deep uh, normative standards and cultural aspects, whether it's around race and gender. Uh, so many shifts that are happening. I mean. It, you know, we're sort of diving into very exotic topics here that, you know, are interesting philosophically, but there's also like a lot of things that are happening in the world right now that also merit just like, you know, with the tools that we have already with social media, you know, how can VR start to maybe create ways to help build deeper empathy, deeper understanding, deeper sense of relationship yep. um, that we're not in this together. I think the coronavirus and COVID-19 is 
forcing us to be able to think about our, not just of ourselves as these individual islands, because this is really an issue that is a community health issue, a community health issue that is not only in one country, but around the world. Uh, and we need everybody in the world to sort of operate at a certain level in order to for everybody to be safe. So it's sort of the, this shift from individualism into this community mindset. So um, yeah, I think VR has the ability to, to help to potentially tell some of those stories or give people some direct experiences for that. And um, yeah, anyway. It's, it, yeah, it, it forms, it, it shapes our brains in a different way as well. Like, right, you, you, we, we consume things in a, in a spatial environment with spatial audio and stuff, and it has an effect on our thinking. It has an effect on how you remember things. It has an effect on how I think about things, right? And that all social experience right now, what even we are having at uh, this moment, is, you know, we will remember that, and it affects us as human beings. It affects our brains, for sure. And um, it shapes us, and it pushes us forward as a humanity, hopefully. Um, and, I, and I think, yeah, uh, the, this we, we, are, we are starting to realize that there are experiences which are out-of-body experiences, let's say, or something which we can digest right now because of the technology and because of what we uh, are having at the moment. Yeah, so... Amazing. I mean, we could go on and on, and uh, I think we would run out of the uh, storage on the uh, on our hard drives uh, for <laughs> for the footage. <laughs> but uh, I would really love to thank you for uh, for coming uh, on our show. Is there anything you want to plug for to our audience? Uh, what they need to download? How do how do they contact you? We'll put your Twitter, uh, hand, yeah. Twitter handle here, of course. Uh, where sure. else they find you? Um, for sure, yeah. I uh, probably most active on Twitter uh, at Kent Buy, and you can follow me there. And um, yeah, I've got a big epic Twitter thread uh, that if you search for uh, thread uh, UFO, you know Kent Buy from Kent Buy on Twitter, you'll you'll probably find this epic two hundred plus that I've been. Uh, it's an epic two hundred plus thread that I've been keeping love the last it. couple of years. If I you want to sort it. of, yeah. and that's that's all the facts and evidence. If you want to go, like you know, don't don't just take my word. Go look at what's out there and sort of dig into yeah. it. Um, and uh, I have a Patreon, so patreon.com slash voices of VR. And so if you want to support the work that I'm doing uh, in the do. uh, trying to capture this real time oral history of VR as it unfolds, and uh, you can uh, support me there. And uh, yeah, I hope to, to uh, launch into some other podcasts uh, about um, philosophy, AI, mathematics, uh, the decentralized web, uh, more esoteric topics as well. Um, you know, I've got, I could, I could, I could sort of sustain six podcasts. Uh, all at once and so yeah if you uh want to support me in, in doing that then uh yeah uh, say you want to hear this podcast and that'll help sort of catalyze the releasing of some of these other interviews that i've done as well amazing so, so uh yeah th please do please uh, go and subscribe uh, and uh, follow kent on twitter if you don't do it right now and uh, thank you again for for coming to to our show and for those who are watching and listening uh subscribe do all this social media magic uh, to you know like our video ring the bell or whatever just press that bell button uh you know all those youtubers are saying that so i have to say that as well uh but yeah please do so and uh remember we're filming it from within virtual reality uh we're present in this location right now uh it was filmed live uh and uh Thank you for watching and until next time, see you on the other side of the monitor. Bye-bye. Bye everybody.